Well, hey, folks, welcome uh, today to this um, Meet the Author Book, book Launch event. Uh, I want to wish a good afternoon and a good morning and a good evening uh, to folks, depending on where you are. Uh, really happy that you are with us today. Um, so welcome to this event with Dr. Chris Poulos. Chris is a professor of communication at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He teaches and researches in the areas of relational and family communication, ethics, ethnography, and autoethnography. He has won several awards for his work, including the Ellis Bachner Autoethnography and Personal Narrative Research Award from the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction, as well as a Best Book Award from the Ethnography Division of the National Communication Association for his first book, Accidental Ethnography and Inquiry into Family Secrecy. Uh, if you know Chris personally, or maybe only uh, via social media, I think you'll know or notice that he's a fervent supporter of other folks' uh, autoethnographic work. Now, he not only promotes it, but also responds to others' questions and queries in kind, constructive, and resourceful uh, ways. And we're here today to talk with Chris about his recent book, Essentials of Autoethnography, published this year by the American Psychological Association. Very exciting. Um, a bit of the structure for today's session, I've asked Chris to offer uh, a brief overview of the book. Um, I will then ask a question, maybe two questions to get us into some discussion about the book and discussion about autoethnography, and then we'll open the ses session to questions from any of uh, y'all. Um, as you think of your questions, uh, you can save them for later, you can throw them in chat. I'm here to moderate uh, the conversation, so um, whatever you prefer to do, I will um, watch where folks are, are working. Um, we'll see how long we go. We're thinking between 45 minutes and an hour. So we'll, we'll just see where the discussion flows. So uh, Dr. Poulos, can you take us away? Sure, before we go, I, before we start, I wanna acknowledge Art and Carolyn, of course, they have been uh, the real supporters and pioneers in this um, autoethnographic adventure we've all taken off on. And they've been sort of, pushing me up all the way ever since the very beginning. And in fact, that award name for them is my favorite award that I've won. So I love that. I also want to acknowledge two of my students, former students who are here, Corey over there in Florida and Sarah, um, both were with me at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro at some point in the past. And I'm, as if they haven't heard enough from me, they came back. So thank you for coming y'all. Um, so this was an interesting little project. I, I like those of you who have written books or have thought about writing books or haven't written books and haven't thought about writing books may or may not know that usually you try to come up with a proposal <laughs> for a book. You have an idea for a book and you write a proposal for it. This was the opposite of that. The APA sent me an email saying um, we're doing this series um, in qualitative methods, which I was actually a little surprised they were going to do. But um, it's a book series and they um, they wanted somebody to write on autoethnography and I said well tell me more and we started talking about it and the next thing I knew I'm getting this I'm getting an assignment like a student like this I haven't had one of these in a long it's been a long time since I was a student I haven't had an assignment like this in a while basically they wanted to write me to write a hundred page book that's what they wanted no more than a hundred pages and I think that's because as those of you who have bought it know, it's $19.99, right? They wanted to keep the price point <laughs> for, I don't know how they figured this out. They probably have smarter people than me with numbers, but all the books in the series are no more than a hundred pages. When they, and then they give you this outline they want you to follow. So the series is followable by everybody. It's um, standardized. So they get, there's, so I'm gonna do that here. I'm gonna just give you the overview there's a conceptual foundations of autoethnography chapter, that first chapter. And they asked me to, you know, what I did there and sort of we, we negotiated all over, over all these points, but um, you know, they wanted a, what is it, a history of it, a rationale for doing it and some history behind it, along with sort of setting it up in the traditions um, that it might align with conceptually. So, that's what I did. I wrote what I think of as one possible history of autoethnography. Um, you could give others, other people have given others and it's, it's, but in my way of thinking about it and looking at it, and I'll be the first to admit this is colored by my own background and experience. I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy 
a master's degree in religious studies and then my PhD is in communication studies. So I see the, you know, the autoethnographic impulse as an interdisciplinary uh, impulse. And, you know, I'm grounded in communication studies, but I don't, I don't worry about that as much as some people in my discipline do. Um, because I see conceptual foundations reaching across those sort of artificial territories we've constructed. And the most beautiful place to see that we just were at, several of us were just there, um, sadly virtually, but we were at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry. And I might as well just give a shout out to Norman Denzen because he's also been a huge supporter of me and, and this work and he made that Congress possible. And it's a I it's it's an electric experience every time I'm there talking to people from you know 50, you know, I don't even know how many disciplines, something like 50 different disciplines and how God knows however many countries. Um, all over people all over the world. And a beautiful thing, autoethnography is catching on around the world. There's been some really intensive, intensive attempts to get um, by the Brazilian contingent who were there in force at ICQI last week uh, to get autoethnography going in Brazil. And um, with the help of some of the scholars from the, from the Congress here in the US who are Brazilian, um, so I see these tendrils sort of reaching outward and coming in. And um, so what I did was trace, you know, my first sort of sense of what sort of philosophical or theoretical foundations that link up and also practical foundations that link up with autoethnography. I trace the, um, a little bit of the history of existentialism, how existentialist philosophers wrote their philosophy and fictionalized narratives. Um, we're talking Camus and The Stranger, Sartre and the play No Exit, and so on, Kafka and um, his books, and, um, and Phenomenology, which sort of um, wants to study the world from in situ, from it, from through experience, symbolic interactionism and social constructionism, narrative theory, dialogue theory, and so on. So I give a little history of that in what is it like all that, you know, if we're looking at the book, it's 16 pages or 19 pages, right? And then and then the, the next part goes into sort of how to do it. So there's a doing autoethnography chapter where I talk about how I go about uh, approaching autoethnography. Um, and I'm going to just call out art again in the background there. It's not a method, right? It's a way of life, right? <laughs> and so we, we're, you know, as we're living, we are doing autoethnographic work, participation, observation, engaging in dialogue with significant human beings in our worlds. Um, and then sort of as we're doing the writing part of it, the doing part of it in that sense, we are... Um, looking at how we get our emotional, spiritual, social, um, philosophical, <laughs> intellectual spirit on the page so that readers can then um, engage with us in some kind of a, a, a fruitful dialogue. And then so from there, there's kind of this structure of the writing, how I do, how I go about the writing of autoethnography. Um, that is what they asked for, for me to say how I go about doing the writing. And we can talk about that in a little more detail. Um, but, and there are two chapters on that. There's sort of the writing part, and then there's the craft part, the sort of rewriting. And I, and I think Corey will recognize this. He took my graduate autoethnography seminar a few years ago. All, you know, I sort of claim in there, um, in that class, blatantly, all good writing is rewriting. Right. It's the it's the process of revision and playing with the words and editing and tinkering and doing all that that we do to make it. Um, to make language. Uh, for lack of a better word, sing for us, like for, for to allow it to to speak forth beyond uh, just simple constructions of of words. Um, so in my own case, I, my writing has a little bit of, uh, I'm not a musician, but I, do, I am attuned to rhythm in writing. And, I, and I'm also attuned to this notion of uh, performance. Um, 
how will how does it sound when read out loud to an audience and so i always tell my students when i when you get stuck in writing autoethnography pull it up and read it out loud to yourself and see where that takes you because it's a different process than just writing it's a, maybe a different cognitive process and have to ask the psychologists in the american psychological association to tell me the truth about that but um i think it is and it does something to shift it and it makes it more um perhaps you know i've said before when i you know i said this the other day when i'm writing autoethnography i'm very often seeing the faces of the people in the icqi group of autoethnographers art and carolyn and ron pelius and um Alyssa foster and lisa lockford and tony and other all the other friends that i've made in that in that audience as kind of muses for me i'm speaking to you all i'm speaking to my community i'm writing to my community yes i'm right as i said the other day in that in one of the sessions because someone asked about well isn't that just writing about yourself and i said absolutely not i'm writing about myself but not for no but not for that i'm writing about us i'm writing the we into being this isn't me doing me search this is me reaching with you towards some larger meaning. Um, it's not something that we have to apologize for, I don't think anymore. I'll ne and I'm like calling out art all over the place here, but I'll never forget one day he said in some NCA meeting, I think it was, it might've been QI. He said something like, we don't have to keep justifying ourselves, do we? <laughs> we should stop that. And I agree with that. Like, I think, you know, now we can say we have claim Heck, y'all have been involved in my favorite gesture. I'm reaching down here for my handbook of autoethnography. This hardback version weighs like five pounds. And if somebody ever asks you to justify it, you just throw it in the air and let it land on the table real loud with a thunk and say, read that and get back with me. <laughs> and really, like, so um, the fact that we have this made this possible because i don't really think i don't know was apa interested in autoethnography five years ago i bet not <laughs> so, so but you know the work that y'all have done and that we've all done collectively as autoethnographers has made it possible to do um to be you know what was called when i went up for tenure 15 16 years ago um, was called into question as, is this legitimate research? And of course, excuse my language, but never fuck with a writer. Like, yes, I gave an argument back and then a hundred other people did too, um, in which um, we did say, you know, we taught, we taught, we schooled the committee on why, in fact, it is legitimate um, human social research. So that was a little bit of a of a side note there, but um, and then so then the book sort of wraps up with questions about variations that we've seen coming forth. You know, Carolyn years ago started writing sort of what she's called evocative autoethnography, and and um, and then people started well doing critical autoethnography and poetic inquiry and um, all kinds of variations, uh, layered accounts performance autoethnography, social fiction, collaborative autoethnography, all these variations on this, this mainstream now of autoethnography have leapt forth from the talent and the, and the wondrous community uh, that's grown up around this way of life. And then the trickiest part, this was, this is just really like, I have, honestly don't know what to say i got i ended up with four pages to talk about ethics i need more than that um i teach ethics you know so i can talk more about that um i've been teaching that for 15 years um but i didn't have space to go very far uh and, uh, and i sort of um I want to subs I subscribe to a kind of dialogical relational ethic of care in doing autoethnographic work. 
in the hope that I don't cause harm to others, but also that I take into account the relationships that are implicated in the work and that um, the work um, impacts in some way. Um, so I've been, I've had to be very careful. I've been careful about that, but maybe not careful enough. Um, I will say, you know, I wrote a lot about secrecy and that's a tricky subject. Um, and, you know, but I've also, it's a tricky subject because people don't want that exposed, right? That's why it's secret. But on the other hand, I, you know, I wonder about how health, healthy that is to, to, to keep it, to always keep them close. And what I found out was the way to get at that particular example was I started assigning my students a little thing on their fall break when they were taking my family communication class, which was go home and see if there's anybody that'll tell you a family secret during fall break or spring break. And by God, they all came back with one. Sometimes they had to search around a little bit, but every secret is a story waiting to be told. And there's always somebody who wants to spill that set, that can of beans. There's always somebody who's been waiting to be asked. And I had a student walk up to me one day with this box. And she's like, this is my family secret box. <laughs> and it was newspaper clippings and all this stuff about this murder that had happened in her family, um, like a mass murder, <laughs> like that basically um, back in the 1800s, her great, great, whatever uncles and grandfather um, stormed a courthouse during a trial and, and shot a witness who was on the stand and then rode off into the sunset, right? Only a posse rode after them and brought them back to the courthouse and they're on the steps of the courthouse going in when the family of the witness they shot comes up and guns all them down in broad daylight. Now, to me, that's a movie, but to this family, it was a shameful secret for some reason until grandma spilled the beans and sent and gave her the whole box and said, here, put this in your book that you're writing for your class. And so um, she's asking me, how do I sort through all this? And I, oh man, you've got, you've got material there for a real book. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if she'll ever do that, but so um, I guess, you know, um, I don't know, Tony, what more should I say? Or do you want to start conversation here? If I've gone on too long, that was probably have. that's awesome. Yeah. 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 And, and I, you know, just the, one of the points I was, the one thing that just was exciting about this book and, and art, you mentioned this, Art's mentioned this on social media, is that this is published with the APA and that is such a legitimate legitimating uh act uh, that is just going to just go into different circles and say i mean they have such institutional you know it's playing that institutional game but you know they've now sanctioned it and, and approved it uh which is awesome and it just, it's so uh, i will say i've worked i've worked with a number of editors over the years they were some hard-nosed editors boy the, and the, the the one question that kept coming back was how is this science? <laughs> I really kept getting this in the margin. I'm like, <laughs> I finally they were said, asking you this. Yes, I finally said, wow. well, it's not, <laughs> and and yet it is in the original meaning of the word. You know, the Greek Wissenschaft is like this knowing be, well beyond. Like, if you want to say, if you're asking me if it's hypothesis, you know, testing a hypothesis and coming to a conclusion. Um, I'll say no, but if you're asking me if it's science in the sense that, and you're going to mess with a philosopher Thales thought of science, um, but for those of you who don't know, he was the first sort of pre-Socratic guy who thought of, was thought of as a scientist well before the years of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, <laughs> so, <laughs> which a lovely, you know, lovely side note to that. One of my colleagues is from Brazil my department and her husband is a philosophy teacher and they're naming their son after that philosopher i love that which i've never heard before it's great very cool anyway well i i'm gonna let me throw out a qu uh, question and then we'll we'll see what folks um hop in and, and hop into chat hop in turn on your camera if you're comfortable doing so um how do you 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 chris how do you uh, start an autoethnographic project? Um, how do you choose the experiences that you are writing about um, and, and or what kind of experiences 
for you work best. And, and, you know, by default, you know, you're, you're giving us the terms of experiences that probably don't, don't work great. So our friend Keith Barry quoted Bud Goodall once in one of those presentations at QI saying, you don't find ethnography, ethnography finds you. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's what happens to me. Like I stumble into things like the reason I got on to secrecy was because I started hearing student, well, actually a student came into my class and uh, into my office and asked, can I write about this? And my ears perked up. And then I started hearing secrets in family conversations sort of leaking out in my own family. Um, I started attending to that phenomenon and that, and by doing that found myself embroiled in this project around secrecy and families and trying to figure out a way to handle that methodologically, which is, you know, what I called accidental ethnography. I, and I've used that sort of phrasing accidental or stumbling into uh, projects more than once. I'm, um, I'm not a very, uh, like there was a person in my workshop at QI who writes outlines and really was excited about having discovered the magic of an outline. I got to tell you, they gave me an outline for this book. It nearly killed me. Like, I don't usually do that. I usually write uh, much more organically than that. Um, and so, you know, the, these projects, but these projects are all things that maybe choose me in some way, but also that I think are important to write about at the time. Um, I do, I have focused a lot on death, but in my defense, I've had a lot of death in my life. And uh, when I was a child, my uncle died on Thanksgiving Day, followed by three other family members in the next year and a half. Um, the year Bud Goodall passed away, 2012, 2013, I lost seven people in my close circle um, in rapid succession in 11 months. And then the year 2019, when I was writing this book, the fall of 2019, my father died in, on July 5th, 2019, a month later, a friend of mine's, a dear friend of mine's wife died of cancer. A month later, um, the best dog I've ever known till I got this one or this one, but the, one of the greatest dogs of all time in our family died. And um, then on my birthday, my dissertation advisor from the University of Denver passed away. And two days later, a dear friend of mine died. So um, there's been a lot of loss. And, um, and I focused a lot on that. There's been some violence in my own background that I focused on. Um, there are a variety of things. I don't have, I can't say that I have, um, I don't know. I don't know if I engineered all that or if it kind of worked me, you know? I can say I sit down to write and I'm surprised sometimes at what comes to me, which is not to say I don't have an idea. Like, and sometimes I'm surprised how it comes. So I'll just give a quick example of that. When I did have that tenure problem, it was a big problem. And I tried to write about it in narrative form. I tried to write an autoethnography about it and I really couldn't do it. And I, I just was, it was too painful. So I set it aside and a couple of years later, I sat down one day in my office and started writing. And I wrote a performance piece called Transgressions, which I had never done before about that, that tenure process. And I, for some reason that all came to me. I wrote all that in kind of a one-off uh, three-hour writing jam session where I was using a Greek chorus and pieces of Macbeth and, <laughs> and Kafka's The Trial and all these things for inspiration. Um, and I would say that one worked me maybe unconsciously for a lot of the time that it was being written. And then I, and then I just sat down and it kind of wrote itself. Um, but I do, I do find, I do seek um, points of fascination. And sometimes for me, those are, often for me, those are the dark sides of, of things like trauma, loss, grief, secrecy, stigma, mental illness, abuse, addiction, dysfunction. But I also seek out sort of the other side, which is dreams and imagination and memory and, and um, Lately, I've been playing around a little bit with what I would call comic autoethnography, 
I don't know if it's funny, but I wrote a I wrote a collaborative autoethnography with my anxiety for QI last week, and people liked it. Anxiety wrote part of it, and I wrote part of it, and um, we performed it together. And um, but I've tr you know I've written some rants and some jokes and some other things that um, and then one time this art was involved in this project. Uh, ben Myers came up to to me after one of those QI sessions. He goes. This autoethnography stuff is sad. <laughs> so, yeah, he's like, could we, do you think we could write something about joy? So he did a special issue of joy on joy, joyful autoethnographies, which Art wrote a piece for, which I loved his title. He can tell you that if he's here still. But um, I wrote a piece, we did a special issue on, on joy in autoethnography. And that was one of the, you know, one of the great things about this is the range that it offers to all human experience and emotion so i've tried to keep myself ranging across that um all the possibilities from deep sadness and grief all the way over to laughter cool okay so we have a, a few questions one easy one what's the what was the philosopher's name uh that you you mentioned um Thales, T H A L E S, but I think in uh, Portuguese they say Thales. <laughs> so, How do you spell it? But it's Greek. T H A L E S, Thales. He's like a okay. the first scientist. <laughs> cool. Uh, next one from Ian. Um, what do you? How do you? What are the differences uh, do you put? But do you use when you think about autoethnography versus uh, narrative? I don't, I, I think of lines between genres is very blurry. They're dotted lines. So I don't think I can make a hard distinction between a straight narrative and an autoethnographic narrative. Um, other than to say autoethnography doesn't, does feature myself as a character, the, the author as character. Um, not all narratives do that. Um, I think a good autoethnography doesn't hit you over the head with that, but it also does um, let you know that it is true that you are speaking from your own experience. Um, but you know, there are, there are so many forms of writing about the self and writing about experience. There's autoethnography. There's memoir. There's creative nonfiction, there's social fiction, there's um, poetic poetry, poetic autoethnography, performance auto. There's so many different genres, but I think, I usually think of it more in what's gonna serve the project that's being written about the best. And for me, that's most often writing in this way, this autoethnographic way, but it may not be true for everyone. I think that's one of the things that APA may be finally realizing or, and hopefully maybe the rest of academia is realizing that we have a big space here. We all can fit. There's no, there's only limits that we impose, self-impose on ourselves. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, here's a question from Sally. Um, it's important to read these because it doesn't pick up on the, the recording, so. Um, yeah. Thinking about secrets and ethics, what are the uh, what about the shameful secrets the writer, author, student has and wants to write about, but could impact them and their reputation, uh, such as mothering, parental shame, which is so stigmatized. They both applaud and feel protective um, of the student. Uh, that's a great question. I I see this a lot with work too. Well, yeah, your um, your book narrating the closet has some um, you know some serious work there on that um what maybe society or somebody thinks of as a shameful secret right um i think um this work requires courage and um fortitude and and yet you know um i do think you um i see why people would want to be protective of their reputation 
I and and there's some positionality to this, right? So like as a tenured full professor, I'd have to make a huge run at um, mistake making to get much consequence for what I do, right? Um, but um, I understand that question. I don't know if I have a great answer for it. I guess one thing to say would be, um, I do private writing and I do writing for public consumption. But Goodall thought of that as the, you know, the field notes and the journals that you write as separate from the text you put forth, but that in those texts that you're writing in the private mode, there may be golden threads of something that is worth putting further outward. If you're speaking to a, a group of readers, you know, there and there are ways to do this that don't expose you as much. That said, I was an editor, an editor of another public special issue about problems in tenure that a special journal issue that Norman Denzen wanted to put forth a couple of years ago. And one of the one of the people that wanted really badly to write a piece for this did not want her name used. So she negotiated anonymous, even though she didn't get credit for it on her CV um, or you know, didn't put it on her CV, but she really wanted to write it. It turned out to be a really beautiful piece, but written by anonymous. Um, so I think she needed to do that for her own well-being to put it out there. Um, but I don't know. Um, I understand why you would shy away from writing about so-called shameful secrets, but also I, I've um, haven't <laughs> I've, I've written about those things in my own life for better or for worse. Uh, can I jump in here? Yeah. Because, um, uh, you know, I really like the ways that you've dealt with this in your writing by, you know, not naming people always, but giving them positionality of father, mother, son, whatever, so that it's not, I mean, people probably could figure it out if they work on it, but it's not immediately clear right. who you're talking about. I think that works uh, beautifully. Uh, yeah, you know, some people fictionalize, of course, and going to just, you know, I taught writing lives a lot with my students, and I was very aware of that issue. I mean, I did not want what they wrote or this class to uh, negatively affect their lives. So I tried to come up with schemes like they would write three papers, but one would be private just between them and me. It would never be shared with anyone in the class. And uh, we talked about, about all of this. And, and I also always gave them an out so that if they got into writing something and it was problem, it became too problematic for them, they could always, it was always a, a, an, an out that, where they could do something else in addition. And so there are lots of strategies, I think, to open up these opportunities for students and yet help them to protect themselves so that they're not doing something that really affect the world that they have to live in after they write this piece. Yes, thank you for that, Carolyn. I would also say that I've been surprised at how courageous students are about writing about this kind of thing, particularly when they trust me as their professor to read it and not share it, right? Um, Corey over there wrote a beautifully uh, courageous piece for my autoethnography class and for his master's uh, final project. Um, it was a deep revelation of self, you know, on a, on a level that many people would be um, frightened to do. But um, I feel like often when they do it, they report that they are glad that they did. And that, um, and he, and they did it in a way that didn't really um, have those, we, there are ways to work it so that it doesn't cause anybody else distress, right? Um, you put yourself on the line maybe a little bit, but not others. And in the book, uh, Accidental Ethnography, I did, I used their story, I used the secrets, but I changed the people, the characters, the names, and the, and did some blending of, of um, stories uh, uh, with, um, not fiction, but with sort of, uh conglomerates of stories about this theme 
so that they could probably recognize themselves. Although in a, you know, in a couple of cases, they were people who were deceased, but um, people might recognize them, but it was, they haven't. <laughs> so, um, or they haven't said anything, but maybe that's a secret. Um, Chris, we have two audience questions, but before we get two sort of questions about audience, yeah. not from audience um, and then, but somebody also asked a, a Petra asked a great question about ethics related to this discussion. Um, what do you think about writing about abusive people, not not for revenge, but because it's my story? I think that silencing the survivors in the name of ethics is violent. I guess it links to the previous question. Yeah, I agree. I you know I think some people have done that beautifully. In this handbook of autoethnography, the first edition, at least, I don't know if it's uh, what's making it to the second edition, Tony. But um, the um, this um, there's a couple of them. Um, well, Carol Rambo's piece called "Twitch" is is not pull punches, um, and there's one by Marilyn Meta. I don't know her, but um, it's about um, abuse and it's intense and it's hard to read and it has pictures <laughs> and. Um, you know, and, and my students were, um, it's called putting the body on the line, embodied writing and recovery through domestic violence. And then years ago in a collection, er, Carolyn and Art did one of those composing ethnography or one of those, there was a Karen Fox who wrote a piece um, from three different perspectives, like from the abuse, the, the, from the sort of the victim, the perpetrator and the, and the author in kind of that one's I'll have to say that one's hard to read but it also I believe uh, made a difference so yes I think um, I think writing it is a good thing overall I will say uh, personally in my own life I've had to couple sometimes had to couple this writing with therapy <laughs> I'm not shy about that. I'll, I'll see a therapist if I need one, because I think we need them. And so I've been to therapy. I've in therapy currently, but because of some of the trauma I have um, experienced in my life and writing about it kind of stirred it up. Well, that's OK for me, because I think it's it helps me um, become a better human. So, yes, but it does take courage to get there. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some folks asked about uh, audi audience for the book, and and this uh, in, in a few ways. One is the general who is who is the audience, the the target audience you envision for this book. Um, but the a related one um, uh, is uh, how could, do you have some suggestions or ideas about how somebody could could work this into um, a, a curriculum? Um, that mm. may not foreground uh, autoethnography specifically, but the, what, how, could this, how could this work into to some courses or any ideas for that? Yeah, so um, I teach two courses. I'm fortunate enough to be able to, um, to decide what I teach, right? So I, it's not everybody's in that position. I teach an undergraduate autoethnography class and a graduate autoethnography class. They're different. I'm, I've used, I used this book this spring in my grad class as the sort of writing process, the auto, the doing autoethnography process manual. And then I use things like the handbook and other articles as exemplars, because I do believe that the way you, one of the ways you have, one of the most important ways you get good at autoethnography is to read good autoethnography and to then find your own voice, your own angle, your own way of doing it. So this book I think is designed to help you do that, to figure out a, sort of your rituals and your ways of going about doing autoethnography. Okay, so incorporating it into a different sort of structure in like, let's say an undergraduate curriculum, I would say I've made it my mission to teach writing, just specifically quality writing in undergraduate education as much as I possibly can. Why? 
because I got bombarded with bad writing. I calculated the other a few weeks ago, and I've now surpassed this, that I think I've read some, this is an average, but I think I've read something in the neighborhood of, of 100,000 pages of undergraduate writing in my career. And not all of it was good, I'll just put it that way, right? And what I noticed was, what I have noticed was, in fact, I got, I got a paper, I read a paper today from a student who wrote as if she had read books. And you can tell the difference between somebody who's read books and somebody who has not read books in a long time. There's a big difference. So I get them to read, I get them to write, and then I get them to read and I get them to write. And I work very hard to get them to read and get them to write. And anything you can do to get them to write, um, then I, for them, I just tell them, hey, this is just like anything else, right? You want to learn how to throw a baseball? You don't do that by yourself the first time perfectly. You do that through practicing. You want to learn how to play a musical instrument? You're going to suck for a while at playing that musical instrument. My son likes to pick up, my youngest son likes to pick up new challenges. He learned how to play drums when he was eight. And he's a really good drummer, but he got tired of drumming and it's too noisy. And it's like, okay. So he sold his drum kit and bought a violin, a fiddle. He wants to play Appalachian fiddle. He lives in the Appalachian mountains, right? He wants to play Appalachian fiddle. So he's playing this thing and he sends me this, this audio of him playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And it's barely, uh, he's, he's my son, so it's good but it's not, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he knows it and um, it's hard and he'll get good by practicing every day, which he does. He goes out on his porch and he practices every day and he'll get good at it. Well, that's how writing becomes good. We didn't just get, we didn't just like fling ourselves at the computer one day, never having written anything and become a best-selling published author. Um, we practice. There's an apocryphal story, maybe a real story about the famous cellist Pablo Casals, who was supposedly in an interview with a reporter when he was like 94 years old. The reporter said, I understand you still practice. And this guy's like the most famous cellist this side of Yo-Yo Ma, like really famous, right? Really good, it was a master cellist. And the guy asked him, why do you still practice four hours a day? And he said, because I want to be good someday, right? I think that's what we need. And so writing is like that. Like, um, and I want my student, I want students to want to get good at writing. So anything you can do, if this book helps you do that in any way, um, by giving them ways to practice or ways to think about or approach writing, I say do it. Like, because they need it. And they think that some of them don't think they do, especially comm majors. They think they can talk their way out of anything. And some of them can. But it will, but then they go out into the work world and they write me back and they say, thank you for teaching me writing because <laughs> I, I can't believe how much they're making me do that. Um, and, um, you know, so that's one way. I, I've, and then I just think we're all hungry for stories. So why aren't we reading more stories? Everybody loves stories. Um, so that too make them read a story tell them it's about your topic <laughs> tell them to find something about well and you know and in fact i you know i used uh tony and my family comm class i used you and the collection you and jonathan wyatt did on family stories and they love that and they're and they're readable they're accessible they're short enough to swallow whole fairly quickly and it's a it's a great book for under for upper division undergrads to read about stories uh, stories about family. So the, that's my unconventional textbook in that class. I don't do the old school social scientific textbook. I do that one. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it uh, La Vega? Is that right? Okay. Um, would autoethnography essays? pieces work uh, move into the audiobook space? Uh, if so, where would that live? What could that look like? Wow, that's a great idea. I, I honestly think um, the podcast space too, right? Um, for this, because I think, um, and that's, that's something to catch the wave on right now. I, I don't know how, I know audiobooks are popular because they allow people to do 
to my friends who do i have a couple of friends who are artists we're in a we read fiction we're in a book group there two of them are artists and they paint these big elaborate paintings you know one guy paints paintings that are as big as my wall behind me and he while he's painting these um pieces of art he's listening to audio books all day i tell him that's cheating because i have to read the book right um but anyway um that but i know podcasts are a wave of pop have hit a wave of popularity so maybe we should start one i don't know um or somebody should get on that on that train but yeah i think it would because i think one of the things i and i'll just be um less glib and answer you later um when i hear this work read at conferences i know that it has power as an auditory experience that's different in many ways from its power as you read it solo in your room alone late at night because you can't sleep or something um so um and i know this from a lot of experience and from hearing all of you that have that are in this room that have done that um perform your work it's it's, it's powerful stuff um, it's it can change you so yes 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 i was told once i went to do a thing i this is a side story i was um i got intrigued by doing voiceover work and that's so why there was i saw i got this flyer and there's a, a workshop at a local community college from a guy from hollywood who was doing uh who would do an analysis of your capacity to do voiceover work and he did this workshop and then he recorded us and uh, gave us advice on sort of how to market ourselves, but how to sell our voices. I never did it, but he told me, you have a fatherly voice. You should re you should do um, nature documentary voiceovers. <laughs> People will trust you as you talk about, I don't know, animals getting eaten by other animals or something. Um, I was hoping he would say I'd be good at like a good cartoon or something, but he went for animal documentaries. But anyway, um, the voice, the voicing of the work is really important. So I think it's a good thing. And it's a story. So yeah, it'll fit. You may have to leave out the citations, but that's okay. I had a, just a quick aside. I was uh, Skyping, uh, Skyping uh, in 2014 with my family communication class with Robin Boylorn and we used her book Sweetwater. And there was a moment where Robin mentioned in um, somebody asked if her if her grandmother read the book, and Robin had this moment where she said, uh, "It was a moment where I I gave my grandmother this book, and I realized that I don't think she can read, and I never realized that before. She's you know she can functionally, um, she's functionally literate to get to the the world on an everyday level." And then a student in the class said, "Do an audio book." And it was this moment in the class that was so, mm. so powerful and in terms of access. And uh, so it was really cool. That was, that was a great, great question. So. She came to my uh, class. She came to my class live a few years ago because she was going down to visit her family in North Carolina. And so I asked her to swing by and then do a, she read a bit out of, she did a performance of a bit out of Sweetwater and they just loved, they loved her writing. They yeah. loved, everybody loves Robin. So. If you get nothing else out of this, you don't even read my book, read Robin Boylan's books. They're great. <laughs> so, well, somebody asked, uh, when asked, this is a very, uh, I'm a beginner. Could you offer two or three suggestions of good autoethnography? And this was related to one of my questions that I, I sent to you earlier today that of good, um, you know, yeah. what are the, what are the things that make good autoethnography and some um, few recommendations? recommendations just yeah read my cv no i'm kidding <laughs> pick something for, no um anything <laughs> tony really anything carolyn and art or art have written tony's written i had stuff that i I'll, you may or may not like my stuff i've written a lot um there's a lot to choose from i would say you know pick a variety um or you know i realized the handbook of autoethnography is expensive um, um in terms of cost but my university has it on library um the library has it so they students can access it um as an ebook um the um there's so many good autoethnographers i will say what makes a good one to me is a 
is a few things, a compelling story with a good hook at the beginning. If you got to make me want to keep reading, right? Don't lose me in the first paragraph because I am busy and I will turn away if it's, if I'm not hooked. Usually I am. So, and this is the best, the best experience I've ever had in this regard was back when Bud Goodall was the chair of my department and he's like a pioneer in ethnography, right? And I walked into his office one day because I read the first paragraph of an article I'd have been signed, I've been assigned as a blind review and I threw it on his desk and I said, this is you, isn't it? I, I've, the first sentence told me it was him. And he just sort of smiled and I said, oh, goody, I get to review my department chair. This is awesome. Um, of course, it was great. So what can I say? But um, so, you know, it has to have, I guess, a good autoethnography somehow shows forth the author's emotion, their spirit, their intelligence, their grasp their, of, of life and what life is like. It offers some way of, and this is what a lot of us make a, um, a distinction about autoethnography. What does autoethnography do? It's not just a story, it's a story that connects to larger contexts of the social, political uh, world we live in. So it does that. Um, for me, I like to be moved. I like emotion. I, I joke that I don't have any, but I do. Um, uh, my parents, you know, my, my mom's family's, um, my mom's side of the family was trained in stoicism. And um, they're good at it, you know, like really good at it. And then my father's side is Greek. And they're like, you've seen that movie, my big fat Greek wedding. Think of the more expressive version of that. Um, louder, more volatile, all of that. Um, my big fat Greek family goes Southern Gothic is how I've described it. Um, so um, I like being moved. I like the human spirit on the page. I like... I like to walk away think I, I like the same thing in movies. I like to walk away from a movie and think about it for three days or five or seven or a year. I like it to prod me to reflect, to, to get me going, to get me to think about something, to get me to reflect, to get me to write. A really good autoethnography will make you write one. I'm serious about this. I have written them after reading them because I needed to, because it's dialogical work, right? It's important dialogical work. And then I would say, you asked me before um, we met what makes a bad one. I've read a couple lately that were, I wouldn't have said they were, I don't, I never like to say to any writer, this is bad. I like to say, here's where you are. Here's what you need to do to get, to make it sing. But when I read one that spends way too much time justifying itself as a method and doing some kind of traditional format and it's 10 pages, I've literally read them for a review that were 10 pages in before I got to any autoethnography. And I'm thinking, that's not an autoethnography. That's a, a wind up to an, that's like not necessary. Cut the first 10 pages and get me right into it. And then worry about whether you need to weave in any kind of like theoretical or and this goes back to how I approach it. I usually write the, these days, all of it sort of blends together, but I'm writing a, st a story first and it becomes an autoethnography as I write, right? Um, and like I said before, I think good writing is a result of good reading, lots of practice, lots of revision, lots of plain old fashioned being neurotic about words. Most people who are writers are neurotic and I'm, among them. That's why I wrote, uh, co-authored a paper with anxiety recently. Um, I can only do that because I have way too much of it. Um, by the way, I gave anxiety a very hard time for messing with me during COVID. Um, so not good autoethnography comes from not paying attention to the writing and, this, and becoming sort of too loose with that. Attunement to detail and to the big picture makes it good. So I don't know if I answered the question though. Good auto recommendations, yeah. You, give. you mentioned Sweetwater too. So oh. any, yeah, go for it. I just saw from Sally in the chat, I just see this question. I don't know where we are in those questions, but I see this one about 
uh, being accepted, invited by the APA, but do you think there's a danger that they will want to manualize it, i.e. it has to be done this way? All right, so we had some negotiations about this. I'm like, you know, uh, there's not a formula. Like, I'm not, I'm not offering like a formula that you can sort of like replicate. I'm telling you what I do. Um, other people may pick up on pieces of that and want to do it, but I'm not going to say this has to be done like this. And they bought it. They don't. They were actually, and I think maybe the editors for this series might be on the loose end of APA, like the looser. But they were hard taskmasters. I'll tell you, um, they were very painstaking about their editing. But I don't think so. I, I, it's possible that they'll want to manualize it. Honestly, I don't know. I think if we get the way I see it is if the way I saw this was there's some audience out there that's asking for this. And it's not the audience that's already, maybe not only the audience that's already reading this stuff. Um, of course, the first people that contacted me, this was the funniest part of this whole thing. I get an email from a friend saying, hey, I got your book in December. I didn't even have it. Like it was, it was due out January 5th and they got it on Amazon 15 days early. So I emailed the publisher and said, how come I don't have a copy when people are buying it on Amazon already? And they're like, what? How is that possible? And I said, because Amazon owns everything and they probably own you at some level. And they got copies, but they were, they were selling it before it was even released. I don't know how that works, but I didn't mind because they were buying the book. But then I got, I got similar emails from like half a dozen other people. It's like, hey, I got your book. This is great. Or on Facebook, hey, I got your book. I'm like, what do you, I don't even have it. Like, I mean, I have the original, but I didn't have my copies. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that was the best part. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe it could get manualized, but I don't worry too much about that. I think I have more things to worry about than that, like my own anxiety, neuroticism, and general levels of trying to pull it together <laughs> and write. Any other questions, thoughts, uh, folks want to ask? Well, that time went by fast. Oh, it does. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to uh, just a quick shout out. We're doing um, uh, IANI, the International Association of Auto Phonography and Everything Inquiry. We're going to do another one of these sessions at the end of June, uh, June 30th, with Hannah Shakespeare uh, on book publishing. And uh, she's this, one of the senior editors at, at Routledge. Um, so she's going to uh, um, be with us to talk through some, some ideas. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Poulos for spending this time with us. You are always so generous uh, with your time and your wisdom and your lived experience and just the care you give to folks and the attention you give to folks. So um, just you. a big thank you. Um, thank you. It keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody um, for being with us today. So hope this was a nice break in the day.